Did you have a good day today? Man, that was a very unenthusiastic, uh, that was unpersuasive. <laughs> I had a great day, really good day. And uh, I don't know, are, are, any of you, are any of you bath takers? Who out there loves to take baths? Right? I am, I am crazy about baths. I probably take more baths than anybody I know. And, uh, you know, it's funny. People say to me, what do you take so many baths for? And the reason is, this, you might, this might strike you as crazy, but I read in the bathtub. I've just done that ever since I was young. My mom would read in the bathtub, and uh, she just passed it on to me. And I wake up in the morning, and my, but the first thing I do is I just get a very hot bath, and I go sit in there, and anywhere from 30 minutes to two and a half hours, <laughs> come out looking like a raisin, but my brain is ready to go. So anyway, the reason I'm telling you that is today I really wanted to take a bath, and I thought, oh, I don't really have time. I don't have time. And uh, I did it anyway, and I've been absolutely scatterbrained ever since. So uh, we're, it'll be fun to see how tonight turns out, right? We'll see what, what takes place. I want to thank Mark for that lovely introduction, and uh, it's really great to be here in Spokane. I'm looking forward to being able to leave and saying, I have spoken Spokane, <laughs> right? Oh, have you ever been to Spokane? I've spoken Spokane. Tonight, we're going to talk about a temple in time, and we're going to continue our unraveling, our unpacking. And let me just say this. Uh, I've been asked to speak five times, but I would be perfectly content if I'd been asked to speak 25 times. Because as I'm preparing and, and getting ready, I'm thinking, oh, I don't have time to say that, and oh, I don't have time to say that either, and I can't really talk about that. And, and I, so what we're getting here is just the very bare bones of what I wish that I had time to be able to share with you. But even in the five presentations that we're going to have together, you're going to learn, I think, a lot. We're already off to a good start. And tonight we're going to turn our attention to a presentation titled, A Temple in Time. A temple in time. Now, we've already been spending time on these three words right here. Why don't you say them with me? Number one, three. number two, time. and number three, time. covenant. We spent most of our first two nights together looking at conflict and the nature of the conflict and what's at the center of the conflict. And at the center of the conflict that Scripture portrays is an accusation against God and against His conduct his character, and by extension, his government. Okay, so we've been looking at that. The whole of Scripture, from Genesis chapter 1, 2, and 3, the front door of the Bible, all the way to the back door of the Bible, Revelation chapters 20, 21, and 22. We're going to resume some of that tomorrow morning, actually, um, in a presentation we're going to title, The Return of the King, right? But what we're going to spend time on tonight is the first of those three elements there, creation. Creation, and of course the Bible opens with this arresting verse, this arresting line, in the beginning, what? In the beginning, God, what did he do? He created. So the very first thing that we learn about God in the whole of Scripture is that he is two things, creative and communicative, right? God is a creator and he's a communicator. In fact, the way that Moses, who wrote the book of Genesis, the, the way that Moses tells the creation story, the means by which God creates is the Bible says he speaks. He what, everyone? Let me just read it to you here. I'm in Genesis chapter 1, verse 1. You're welcome to join me there. It says, In the beginning God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was on the face of the deep. Describing the primordial circumstances in which creation arose, and the Spirit of, the, of God was hovering over the face of the waters, then God said. The first action that we are introduced to that God performs is the act of speaking. This is the means by which He creates, right? And so in those first three verses, we're in the first chapter of the first book of the Bible, and in those first three verses, we are introduced to a God who is preeminently creative and He is passionately communicative. In fact, over and over again, Moses records this phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and God said. The means by which God creates is his voice, and God said, and the thing comes to be. And he said, for example, here in this verse that we're in right now, verse 3, let there be light, and immediately it says there was light, right? So we're introduced to God here as both creator and as communicator. And God said, and God said, and God said. 
The term that the philosophers or the theologians would use for the kind of creation that's being described here is called ex nihilo. Creation ex nihilo. It means ex, out of nihilo, nothing. It's not as though God went, you know, scavenging around the universe and gathered together the raw materials with which to create and then he fashioned it into something. No, he is creating out of nothing, ex nihilo. He's just speaking. Let there be light. There is light. Let there be a sun. There is a sun. Let there be. God is creating by speaking, right? So we're introduced to God as a creator. And one of the fascinating things about the way that God creates, and this is a well-documented pattern in Genesis chapter 1 that scholars and, and students of Scripture have noticed over the years, is that God creates by beginning with spaces. I've got a picture of a canvas here, a blank canvas, right? Just imagine a painter approaching a blank canvas. What there is is a, a large area of negative space. And the painter, he or she, as, as they approach the canvas, they will put their own creativity, their own passion, their own skill onto the canvas. Right? They fill the canvas. And there's all different kinds of painters, of course. There's the realists, and there's those that are abstract, and there's, there's the, the modern painters, and there's all these different sort of genres of paint, uh, painting, and even er- different eras and styles of painting. And, and it's fascinating that the way that Moses describes the creation account is that God begins with a series of canvases. He actually creates the canvases himself. Right? Let me just read you the first of the canvases that God creates. In verse 4 it says, And God saw the light, that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. And God called the light day, and the darkness he called night. So the evening and the morning were the first day. So day one is kind of out of the way at this point. God has created light. Second day, first canvas. Then God said, there's that recurring refrain. Then God said, let there be a firmament... Now, that's an interesting word, firmament. It's a very biblical word. It's, it's a word that never comes up in day-to-day conversation. You, can you imagine? To be like, yeah, you know, the, the, my, the, the door on my firmament is broken. I've got to get that thing fixed. You know, if you said that to somebody, they'd be like, you're what? You're, you're, yeah, yeah, you know, the fir- we need to get the flooring replaced in the firmament. Nobody would know what you were talking about. The word just means space. It means an expanse right? It says, God made, uh, let there be a, an expanse in the midst of the waters, and let it divide the waters from the waters. Now, we've already been told that the earth at this point was a watery mass. It says that the Spirit of, the, of, of God was hovering over the deep, okay? So, the picture that, that is emerging here is of a fluid mass, a liquid mass, And after God has begun by creating light, the first thing that he does is he creates a space, right? It's as if the hands of God are inserted into the watery mass, and he separates, the Bible says, the waters that were above the space from the waters that were below the space. And he called that space, that that firmament, that expanse, heaven, right? So the first thing that God creates is not actually a thing so much as it's a space for a thing. He creates a canvas. He creates a, what did I say, everyone? He creates a canvas, just like we saw there on our screen a moment ago. He creates a canvas. Now, as the story continues to unfold, uh, verse 9, Then God said, Let the waters under the heavens be gathered together in one place, and let the dry land appear. And so it was. Here, God is gathering together the the waters into a place, and as he brings the waters here, the land emerges here, and what God has done is he's created two more canvases, right? Here's a canvas, a liquid canvas, right? He began with the, what you might call the canvas of the air. In fact, I'll put it up on the screen here so you can remember that. There's your canvases. He creates a canvas of air, a firmament, and then he creates a canvas of water, a space, and then he creates, by, by extension, since he's gathered all the water together, there's these expanses of land, right? These are the first few days of creation. God is creating not so much the presence of things, but the space in which to put things. You follow that? There's a, there's a symmetry here. There's a poetry here. There is a, there's an, a beauty There's an artistry here. I mean, God literally, with the uh, resources of omnipotence at his disposal, he could have just said, all right, let the whole thing come together, 
right? But there's an intentionality here. There's a, there's a purposeful um, point to the way that God is creating. We're going to see what it is as we continue our, our discussion here. God is creating not in any just willy-nilly, serendipitous way, you know, by the seat of his pants. No, he's creating very specifically. It begins by making light, and there's huge significance to that, which we don't have time to get into. And then he makes a series of spaces. He makes a space in the air, he makes a space on the water, and then he makes a space in the land. Now, that's the first three days of creation. God spends the next days of creation, days four, five, and six, filling those spaces. Right? He fills the spaces. For example, on day four, it says that he set the sun and the moon and the stars in the heavens. That's the fourth day, right? So here's his first space, air, and now he fills that space with all of these lights. Okay? Then he has the second space there, which is, is the water. And on the fifth day, he fills the water with all of the water creatures, with all of the sea creatures. And on the sixth day, he fills the land with all of the earth creatures. And so we see a symmetry here. The actual technical word is a chiasm. There's a chiastic structure. It comes from the Greek word chi, which looks like our letter X, right? In which certain aspects of that geometrical symbol correspond to other aspects. And, and Scholars and Bible students over the years have noticed, hey, wait a minute, God's creating in a pattern a poetic and intentional and beautiful pattern. You know, what word did I say, everyone? In a pattern. Now, let's continue to unpack this because you'll notice that there is a fourth canvas there. Now, I'm going to read the last verse here of Genesis chapter 3. Genesis chapter, or excuse me, Genesis chapter 1. Verse 31 says this, Then God saw everything that he had made. He saw his three canvases and the things with which he had filled. He saw his paintings, we might say. God saw everything that he had made, that he had painted, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Right? That's, Ge that's Genesis 1. Make three spaces. Choo, choo, choo. Fill three spaces. Choo, choo, choo. Now, you may or may not be aware that the actual chapterization and the versification of Scripture, that is to say the, where chapter 1 begins and cha or chapter 1 ends and chapter 2 begins and where chapter 2 ends and chapter 3 begins, etc., all of that has been added much later. Moses didn't write chapters and he didn't, certainly didn't write verses. If I had gone and done the chapterization, I would have actually made chapter 1 extend down past chapter 2 to verse 3, all the way down, because notice the very next thing that it says. That's this chapter 2, verse 1. It says, thus the heavens and the earth and all the host of them were finished, right? There's a finality here. There's a conclusion. And on the seventh day, oh, well, there we go. On the seventh day, God ended his work which he had done, and he rested on the seventh day from all his work which he had done. Then God blessed the seventh day, and he sanctified it, because in it he rested from all his work which he had created and made. And then verse 4, sort of a summary. This is the history of the heavens and the earth when they were created in the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens. Now, you'll notice then that there is a, a, a fourth space here, a fourth, can, a fourth canvas but here's the fascinating thing about this canvas. Unlike the three preceding canvases, which were spaces in space, they were extended in the spatio, you know, spatio dimension that we know of, the, 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 the dimension that we're stuck in. There's another dimension that we're stuck in, not just space, but we're stuck in something called time, right? This is what physicists refer to as the spatio-temporal reality in which we find ourselves. Space and time, and, and this is where Einstein and his, you know, grand theories that, that few of us probably fully understand began to say, these are actually not two things, they're one thing, right? These, these are two, they, they appear to be two things to us, but that's because of the unique situation in which we find ourselves here on earth with this gravity and this circumstance, but in fact, Einstein said that, that these are one and the same kind of a thing, space and time. But in Scripture, we are introduced to this fourth canvas, not as a geographical canvas, not as a geographical space, but as a chronological space, a space in time. And this is why we're calling our presentation tonight a temple in time. And we're going to see as we progress here, notice there, time, a space in time. That's the canvas with which God creates this seventh day. Now, that seventh day will become hugely significant through the whole of Scripture, okay? 
The seventh day will come to be called the Sabbath. What's it called, everyone? The Sabbath. Now, that word is not used here yet. In fact, the word Sabbath doesn't occur in the book of Genesis, so far as I'm aware. The word Sabbath is not going to be used or applied to this seventh day until later, but we're introduced to the idea of the seventh day, the concept of the seventh day, a day in which God himself rested from his works, which raises the question, why would a being who is infinitely powerful rest? I don't know about you, but I need rest. I mentioned at the beginning that I like to take baths. The other thing I like to take is naps. Any nappers out there? Right? I tell you, I'm a napper. I love a good nap. And um, I, read, I read a book a number of years ago. Actually, it was an article more than a book that was talking about all the great men and women in history who took naps. Right? And I was like, oh, I'm in good company. Edison was a napper. You maybe didn't know that. Abraham Lincoln was a napper. Right? I'm a napper. I love my naps. And the reason that I like naps is I just get a little tired, get a little fatigued, and I just need some rest. God was not tired. It's not as though he said, oh, whoo, making that hippopotamus really took it out of me. You know, that's a big round creature. I need a nap. No, 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 no. God rests for a very different reason. Notice this. God does not rest from fatigue, but to create a social and spiritual space. Now, why would I say a social space? Well, there's a whole background here in Genesis chapter 1 and 2 that we don't have a lot of time to get into, but I'll just maybe briefly mention. Genesis chapter 2 says this in verse 7, And the Lord God formed man of the dust of the earth and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living being. This is remarkable. Because as we've already mentioned, when God was creating there in Genesis chapter 1, Moses says that God created with the vehicle of his voice. That was the means by which he created. And God said, and God said, and God said, and God said, and shoo, 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 shoo. God said, let there be a sun. Shoo, let there be a space. Shoo, let there be the waters together. Shoo. God is speaking. But in Genesis chapter 2, which transitions sort of from a chronological treatment of Scripture to a more relational treatment of Scripture, Moses now digs into especially the creation of that thing that was made in the very image of God. Now, this is hugely significant. The importance of this literally cannot be overstated. When God makes mankind in his image, he does not make just males in his image, neither does he make just males or females in his image. He makes mankind, male and female, in his image. And the first thing that God says to man and woman is, be fruitful and multiply. In other words, make another. The thing that God makes in his image is a race a kind, a species of creature that is both sexual and social. Now, why sexual? Well, as human beings, we are aware that we have the female gender and the male gender, and in the coming together of the male and the female, that's where procreation takes place, right? It's where reproduction takes place. There are, in the biological world, species of animal uh, and creature that are asexual, there isn't the male-female distinction. That's remarkable for us to think about, but it's true. There are asexual creatures in the biological world. But when God made man and woman, he made a man and he made a woman, and he said the two will come together, and in the act of coming together, they are obedient to the command of God, be fruitful and multiply. So mankind is not only sexual, he is social. There is some sense in which the man is incomplete. And there is some significant sense in which the woman is incomplete, and that incompleteness is actually mentioned in Genesis chapters 1 and 2 before there's anything bad, before there's any death, before there's any sin, before there's any disease. None of, no evil has crept into God's creation as yet. And yet the Bible says there was one thing that was not good in Genesis 1 and 2. It says it was not good that man should be alone. Why? Because he's a social being. We understand this intuitively today. We know this, right? Because people that live by themselves, I mean, in radical solitude, like the hermits of the world and the recluses of the world, we regard that as unusual. Most of us couldn't live under those circumstances. In fact, this is an even easier illustration. When we set out to punish somebody for, a, for an act that they've done that makes them unsafe to society and unsafe to the world around them, how do we punish them? We put them by themselves. 
We say, you, are no, you, no, you have abused the privilege of being in and around other people. You have abused your social, civil privilege. So we will put you in isolation within a prison where you can't just go where you want to go. You can't just do what you want to do. Another kind of interesting element there is that we also rob them of the, of the uh, complementary sexual element. There's male prisons and there's female prisons. And we understand this to be punitive. We know intuitively that when you are locked away in isolation, and then even within the context of a prison, if you are placed into isolation even from your own inmates because you do something particularly egregious or you get into real trouble, you are placed totally by yourself. And we understand that's a punishment. We are social creatures. Right? From the, very, from the very dawnings of conscience and, and consciousness, as we become aware that there are other creatures around us, you know, you place a little child in a room, a toddler or two, of two or three years old, and the vast majority of them, if there are other toddlers in the room, will go naturally. Right? You don't have to teach them that. They, just, they are like magnets to social situations, and most of us are. Now, we get burned in our lives, and people hurt us, and, and we have situations where we feel uncomfortable, for the most part. We are naturally inclined towards social situations and away from isolation. Now, this is a remarkable thing because God said, this social reality is in my image. This what reality did I say? This social reality is in my image. And this goes beyond the the scope of our talk tonight. But I will just mention that Scripture reveals God not as a rigid singularity existing in, in isolation. Scripture reveals God as a community of Father, Son, and Holy Spirit as a social unit. In fact, let me put the word on it that belongs on it. As a family. Right? It's not... It's not by happenstance or serendipity that the word father is used to refer to God. You will will recall perhaps in one of the instances in the New Testament, Luke chapter 11 to be precise, when the disciples approached Jesus because they'd overheard him praying. Man, I loved the way this guy prayed. He prayed with such passion. He prayed with such intimacy. He prayed with such connectivity that the disciples approached him and said, man, you don't pray like the other religious people. You don't pray like the other... Teach us how to pray like you pray. And and Jesus said, oh, you want to pray like I pray? I was hoping you would ask. Pray like this. Two words. Our, that's connection. That's social. That's communal. Our, and what's the word? Father. See? God makes a social reality in his image. He doesn't just make a male Right? In isolation. No, because that doesn't fully exemplify the character of God. It doesn't fully exemplify the, 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 the nature of God. God makes a man, he makes a woman, and the first thing that he says is, make another. Create this beautiful, ever-expanding social reality, and the rule by which that social reality will be conducted is love. Other-centeredness. You put the needs, wants, desires, hopes, ambitions of the other in front of yourself and all will be well. So far, so good? Okay. So God does not rest from fatigue, but to create a social and spiritual space. He creates a space. Adam is not only a physical being. Eve is not only a physical being. She's a social being and he is a spiritual being. Right? And so God gives them a space, not a space geographically. Not a couple acres in a garden. No, he does give them that. Several acres, no doubt. Perhaps hundreds or square square miles. We don't know the exact size of the garden, but we know the garden was to be expanded. But he creates a space in time. Right? And that space in time was a place not only for Adam and Eve to commune with one another and with their forthcoming offspring, but especially to commune with God. Now, this is a remarkable thing because just as God made a space and he filled it, with an air space and he filled it and he made it watery space and he filled it and he made an earthy space and he filled it. God here makes a time space and he fills it with himself. It was a time and a space to meet God. And we're introduced to this right out of the gate. I mean, we're, we're only a chapter and a half into Scripture. Say the first two chapters of Scripture and we're introduced to this radical idea that man is a social, spiritual, sexual being that comes together to interact not only on the horizontal level with one another, but on the vertical level with their creator and maker. So far, so good? Have I lost anybody yet? Good. So look at this. 
The seventh day Sabbath precedes sin and death. The importance of this cannot be overstated. There's no sin here. There's no death here. There's no disease as yet. Evil has not yet entered God's creation. It is a link to God's original intent in creation, this Sabbath thing, this seventh day thing. Now, with that in mind, with that sort of background in mind, I want to talk a little bit about the book of Genesis. Okay, the book of Genesis, of course, is the first book of the Bible written by Moses. And the book of Genesis has maybe the most unusual structure of every book in the Bible, arguably. It's very unusual the way that, well, it's not unusual. It's seemingly unusual the way that Moses has constructed the book of Genesis. Because you would think, if you were going to write a human history, you would not have written it with the sort of emphasis and the skew, the bias with which Moses clearly writes it. And I've given you a graphic here on the screen. The first 11 chapters of the book of Genesis are by far the most controversial section in the whole Bible. By far, no question, right? Far more controversial than Jesus resurrecting from the dead, more controversial than Jesus walking on water, than the healing of people. You know, all of that, as controversial as it might be, Jesus being born of a virgin, you know, all of the sort of liberal and secularists that would take issue with that, all of that pales in comparison in terms of its basic audacity and its basic controversy to Genesis chapters 1 to 11. Because Genesis chapters 1 to 11 sets forth a history of primordial earth in just a few short chapters covering not less than 1,500 years and perhaps as much as some 2,000 years of human history in 11 chapters. Now just let that sink in. Can you imagine writing the history of the world, say even just Western civilization, say, say even just the culture that, with which we are familiar, writing a history of that from the time of Jesus until now in 11 chapters? Would you have to leave out a few things? Yeah, like basically everything. Right? The events that we have in Genesis chapters 1 to 11 are four. We basically have four events, okay? What are those four events? Creation, I've mentioned, right? The flood, right? We have creation, we have the flood. In fact, we could even further uh, summarize it to three events or further you know, reduce it to three events. Uh, we do have the, we have the story of Cain and Abel, which is very brief, and we have the Tower of Babel. Right? Now you just think, let that settle into your brain there for a moment. 2,000 years of human history, and what we end up with is, there was a creation, there was a great big flood, and there was a tall tower. I would say that that is a fairly reductionistic history of two, some 1,500 to 2,000 years of human history. Are you with me? The truth of the matter is we know almost nothing about the early earth. Right? Scripture doesn't give us many details. But here's the remarkable thing. When Moses gets to Genesis chapter 12, he hits the brakes. And I'll read you verse 1 of Genesis 12. It says, Now the Lord had said to Abraham. To who? It's Abram, but I'm calling him Abraham. He will later have his name changed to Abraham. Now the Lord said to Abram, Get out of your country and from your family into your father's house. And if Moses has been racing through the first 11 chapters, some 2,000 years of human history, as soon as he gets to Abraham, he puts the brakes on full stop. Just like... The whole thing slows down. Because you'll notice... From chapters 12 to 50, there's 50 chapters in the book of Genesis, that covers roughly 300 years of human history. It's the story of one family, Abraham's family. So he races seemingly recklessly over the whole of the early earth's history, right? Three events in some 1,500 to 2,000 years. And the moment he gets to Abraham, he's like, okay, now this is the point. For Moses, as well as for every scriptural writer, by the way, every scriptural writer, Abraham is a central figure. Now, as the story of Abraham is told, and I don't have time to get into it, though I wish I did, there's this guy named Abraham, and he has a promised son. That promised son's name is Isaac. Isaac then ends up having children, and of the children that he has, there's two, Jacob and Esau, and Jacob ends up having a bunch of kids, 12 of them, and those children become, they become what are called the children of Israel, right? Basically, Genesis is written for the express purpose 
so that you can make sense of the next four books that you're going to read from the hand of Moses. Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, Deuteronomy. It's the backstory. You would never understand Exodus, Leviticus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy or any of Scripture if you didn't have Genesis. Right? It's the basic fundamental groundwork to get us headed toward where Scripture is going. And where Scripture is going has something very significant to do with this guy named Abraham. What's his name, everyone? Abraham is his name. Man, Abraham becomes the absolute central figure. Moses is clearly moving purposefully and speedily to the story of, together, Abraham. He's getting to Abraham. Well, the descendants of Abraham, the children of Israel, end up in a place called Egypt, right? And God then, after a number of years, calls a man named Moses. Moses becomes another major figure in Scripture. The big figure sort of in the Old Testament we run into Adam. It's big. Noah is big. Abraham and his descendants are big. Moses is a gigantic, looming figure in the Old Testament. David later. Right? Those are the major figures of the Old Testament there. Not that there aren't other significant players, but those are the big dogs. Right? Those are the big ones. You got Adam, you got Noah, you got Abraham, you got Moses, and you got David. Right? These are the central figures. And again, there's a whole lot of other supporting players and supporting actors here, but there's something very significant about Moses. Because Moses is called by God to go recover the descendants of the family of Abraham from a land in which they have found themselves in captivity. In that way, it's quite similar to the story of God calling Abraham, because the first thing that God says to Abraham is, get out of there. And now we find Moses, God saying to Moses, hey, go tell my, ch my people to get out of there. Right? God is forever calling his people out. Hey, come out of there and, and come out of there. And that motif by the way, is picked up in the back door. We're going to go through the back door here. That motif of get out of there, God says to his people, get out of there, is picked up in Revelation, where God says, come out of her, come out of Babylon, my people. That is straight out of the story of Abraham, and it's straight out of the story of Moses, right? This is what's called recapitulation, or a revisiting of a biblical theme or a biblical narrative. Now, when the children of Israel are finally brought out of Egypt, Egyptian slavery, they come to a mount, mountain called Mount Sinai. Okay, this is familiar to us, for many of us. Mount Sinai is this central mountain. In fact, I don't know if you knew this or not, Hollywood right now is preparing to release a movie on Moses. Right? Looks very interesting. It's called, I think, of Gods and Kings, the Exodus. Right? right now, big movie, big Hollywood blockbuster. I'm frankly terrified because I heard reports about the movie Noah, that it was so far removed from what the Bible... I never saw it. I never saw it. I, I don't trust Hollywood to tell me what happened. I don't, what do I need to go there for? I'll, I'll just go here to see what the story of Noah is. And I heard it was catastrophic. But anyway, that's, that's another story. I hope that the story of Moses is not similarly catastrophic. But whatever it is, maybe in some sense it'll at least direct people's minds toward this seminal event where God calls his people and he brings them to a mountain. Now on that mountain, I'm jumping ahead here to Exodus chapter 20, we encounter this Sabbath idea. Again, right? The Sabbath is scarcely mentioned in Genesis, only at the outset. Only at the outset there we encountered the seventh day. And then it's largely gone from, from the record that Moses writes. He does pick it up briefly in Exodus 16 as the children of Israel are on their way to Mount Sinai. But it's here at Sinai that we encounter the Sabbath again. Now, here's an interesting thing. When God gives the Ten Commandments, we read the commandments as prohibitions, which is really unfortunate. Because you'll notice what I've put here at the top of the, the, the screen there. What does it say? The Ten Promises. Right? The Ten Commandments are not really commandments in the sense of a negation. They're commandments in the sense of a promise. Now let me just read you that. Verse 1 says, I'm in Exodus chapter 20, verse 1. Then God spoke all these words and said, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. You shall have no other gods before me. Right? You shall have. The idea that's communicated here is you will no longer have other gods before me. Not the you had better not or else, but the promise that that won't be happening anymore. I will enable you. I will give you the ability to no longer 
bow down and serve those other gods, in quotation marks. It's a promise of deliverance and of freedom. And I tell people all the time, don't forget, the first thing that's in the Ten Commandments is not don't do something. The first thing in the Ten Commandments is you are a free people. And on the basis of your freedom, I am the Lord your God who brought you out of the land of Egypt, out of the house of bondage. On the basis of your freedom, you will no longer be doing this. And I'm going to make it so you no longer will do that. And you'll be able to not do that. And you're not going to be able to do that. And not that they couldn't in the sense of their free will, but that God says, I will empower you to not live that way anymore. You are free to be free. That's a great verse in the New Testament. Galatians chapter 5 verse 1. Love it. My current favorite verse where Paul writes and he says, For freedom Christ has set you free. What a funny thing to say. You're set free to be free. We mentioned that in our first presentation there, that that when God placed Adam and Eve in the garden, he said, of every tree you may, do you remember the word? You may freely eat. See, we have an insight here into God's basic parental governmental posture in Genesis chapters 1 and 2, where God has a thousand yeses for every no. So many of us think of God as restrictive, as wanting to take away In reality, the opposite is the case. God is a giver. God is a lover. God delights in freedom. That's why you come to the New Testament, you encounter all these wild verses where Jesus would say things like, if the Son will make you free, oh, then you'll really be free. Right? There's this value. Freedom itself is a value. I want to say that again. Freedom itself is a value with God. Because without freedom, there can be no growth. Without freedom, there can be no character development. Without freedom, there can be none of the great things that flow from the stream of freedom and liberty. Freedom is the most rock-bottom, fundamental, foundational reality to the universe. And, And by the way, we know this intuitively. We know it, we sense it intuitively, because just imagine I'm walking down the street here. I'm walking down the street, or you're walking down the street, right? You're walking just anywhere, down the street or in the mall, and if you're just walking, casually minding your own business, and and a person comes up to you and grabs you. You don't know this person, they're not a cousin, they're not a neighbor, they're not a brother or a sister. If a person just grabs you by the arm and tries to pull you with them, what will you instinctively do? You'll pull back, you'll resist. Nobody has to teach you to resist. It's it's in your nature, it's in your DNA, it's in your genes. And here's the point. Because you understand intuitively that there's something fundamentally wrong with coercion and with control. You will resist it instinctively. One of the best books I've read in the last five years is a book by a woman named Laura Hildebrand called Unbroken. Has anybody read this book, The Story of Louis Zamperini? Raise your hands if you've read it. Tell me that wasn't one of the best books you ever read. They're getting ready to make a movie out of it, and I'm terrified because I'm just sure it's going to be terrible. Because you know what? The book is great. The movie's always half as good. Well, let me recommend to you right now, without reservation, this book called Unbroken. You need to read it, okay? It's a prescription from David. Read the book. Get the book. Read it. You won't be able to put it down. I don't know if that was your experience. I picked the book up, and it was done two days later. You just can't stop reading it. And it tells the story of a man named Louis Zamperini. Louis Zamperini was on his way, destined almost certainly to become the first man to ever run a mile in under four minutes. Now, Roger Bannister would do it later, but the war got in Louis Zamperini's way. Great story of survival and, and, of, and of overcoming adversity. And, and he ends up, and I won't spoil the story for you here, but he ends up in a series of Japanese concentration camps where he is controlled, where he is abused, where he is humiliated. And as you're reading the book, I'm sure you had the same experience, you just have a growing sense of anger, don't you? Just unresolved frustration. The book is hard to read, by the way, but you'll love it. Hang in there, hang in there. He's, you just get, and you, because we sense, we, we sense that there's something wrong with controlling or being controlled. Am I wrong or am I right? When, when we try to constrain people, they, they instinctively want to resist. If we try to grab somebody and pull them with us, they will instinctively not want to go that way. I mean, what is the opening line of the Declaration of Independence right there where it talks about we, we, we hold these truths to be self-evident. It's a, it, it needs no external corroboration. That people are gifted with, with 
certain, unalienable, it means they can't be divorced from you, rights by their Creator, that among these are life and what? Liberty. I love it, man. The giants, largely Thomas Jefferson, but the giants that wrote these early American documents understood something that we all know intuitively, and that is that liberty and freedom are themselves the highest values in the universe. Freedom and liberty. And God says, you're free! Now go be free. Live free. Be free. You will no longer be enslaved to those other gods. You will no longer be enslaved, second commandment, to idols. You will no longer be enslaved to taking my name in vain. You will no longer be enslaved, full stop, fourth commandment, the Sabbath. Let me just read that to you. Exodus chapter 20, verse 8. Remember the Sabbath day. Clearly they knew about it before because he's saying, remember it. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. It already was holy, but you remember to keep it that way. You're free now. Six days you shall labor and do all your work. Now that sounds really good to a people that have been laboring like dogs for seven days a week. As slaves, controlled. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord. Ah, that's back in creation. That's the creation. It's God's Sabbath. In it you will do no work. No, not you, not your son or your daughter, your male servant, not your female servant, not even your cows who, or the stranger that is staying the night with you because in six days the Lord made the heavens, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day, and therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Oh, I love this. God says you're free to be free, and you're free to not be enslaved to a pharaoh, and you're free not to be enslaved to finances. You're free. Oh, look at this. The Ten Promises reduce to four basic concepts. The first four promises, the first four commandments revolve around relationship with God. We'll come back to that in just a second. The fifth commandment is honor your father and your mother, so family. The rest of the commandments, the, the next six, seven, eight, nine, those four have to do with how we relate to people on the horizontal level. Don't kill them, don't take their spouse, don't lie about them, and don't steal from them. You're free to not live that way anymore. And then the Tenth Commandment has to do with stuff. Don't covet your neighbor's Ferrari. Don't covet your neighbor's house. Don't covet your neighbor's fishing boat. Don't covet your neighbor's stuff. Right you have right there in the Ten Promises is basically a divine prescription for happiness. You want to be happy, God says? I made you. I wrote the instruction manual on, on happiness and freedom. This is what freedom looks like. This is what happiness looks like. God first, family next, others next, followed by stuff. And I tell you, modernity has reversed that. Man, we live in a culture that says, man, happiness comes from stuff, followed by friends, gadgets. We need more gadgets, more stuff, the accumulation of stuff, followed by gadgets, family if there's any time left over, and God, huh, as if. Right? That's the world in which we live. It's the reversal of the very prescription. Now, here's a remarkable thing. When you look at those first four promises, what's at the heart of those four promises there, those four freedom promises. The first thing God says, you will have no other gods before me. Not you are not allowed to, but you're free to not. What's God saying? When I married my wife, April 4th, 1999, the minister said to us, do you take this woman to have and to hold? Let me translate that for you. Will you set your affections upon this woman? Oh yeah. And she's an easy one to set your affections on too, I tell you. I was like, boom, I'll put my affections on her all day long, right? I only hope she reciprocates. And she's like, yes, she did too. So when it says you will have no other gods before me, it's not just saying like you'd have a god in your pocket. All right, all right, give me your gods. All right, here you can have it. No, it's not like that. What it's saying is set your affections on me. You're free now to give me your affections. Second commandment says, don't bow down to any graven image or any old foolish thing like that. Don't go bowing down to, to wood and stone and metal. You made that. Don't bow down to it. You're smarter than the thing, right? Don't do that. God says, no, you're free to no longer be in, as enslaved as the Egyptians were to those things. Give me your body with which you make and with which you bow. Give me your body. 
The third commandment, he says, don't take my, you're free to no longer take my name in vain. You don't have to live in a perpetual state of hypocrisy as the descendants of Abraham, but actually chasing and following after other gods. You're free now to live lives of consistency and humility and beauty and love. You are free from hypocrisy. Give me your words. Because a hypocrite is somebody who says one thing and does another. And then finally, that fourth one there. Give me your time. That social, spiritual place that I gave to Adam. That social, spiritual space that I gave to Eve. Meet me there. You're free to meet me. No longer a slave to Pharaoh. No longer a slave to your own finance. Meet me there. Now you just take a look at that right there and you tell me. If that is not itself the recipe for every good relationship in your life. That's what, that's what you're saying to your spouse. I give you my affections, yes. I give you my body, yes. I give you my words, yes. I give you my time. No wonder when Jesus was asked, all right, Jesus, tell us once and for all, what's the great commandment? He would say, oh, the great commandment is to love the Lord your God. To love. Well, how do you love? You give your affections. You give your body, right? Your physical person. Can you imagine me saying to my wife, I love you, but I'm just not really keen to be near you. If your body's there, I want my body over there. No, 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 no. We, and we give our bodies not only in a sexual sense, but we give our body in a, in a fraternal sense as well, that go hang out with your friends. Right? Don't we like to do that? No, no, I'm not going to come. Just bring a picture of me. Here's a picture. Well, I don't want to go either. Take a picture of me. And there's just like four... Four, you know, there's four pictures there, and a guy's looking. No, your body is there. You're there. And we give our words. Can you imagine? Violetta, I love you, but don't make me say it. Do not make me say it. And just a word, men. And women, I suppose. But I can speak with a greater degree of authority and strength to the men. Your wife should hear that you love her every day. And not in some language that has to be decoded. Yeah, right? Not like, not like, yeah, I, f I filled the car up with gas. <laughs> it's like, man speak, for I love you. I've performed this act of providership. You know, and the woman's like, you never tell me you love me. What do you, I, I, told, I, I filled the car up with gas. It's like, come on. Come on. Stop being so manly. Stop being so ridiculous. Just open up your mouth and say these words to your spouse. I love you. And while you're at it, try this one on for size. You look beautiful. Come on now. I ask some of my friends, I'll say, hey, when was the last time that your husband told you you were beautiful? Last summer. Oh, come on. Shame. Shame on you if you're doing that. No way. Every day I love you. Every day you're beautiful. Every day, man, I'm lucky I landed you. By the way, just a little piece of marital advice here. You do that, and your wife, your girlfriend, your fiancé will open to you in a way that, that can only be drawn out by affirmation, right? It can only be drawn out by affirmation and, and by connectivity. Oh, man, I could spend a lot of time. Invite me back. I'll talk to you about marriage. That's another story. Okay. So, affections, body, words, and time. The first four promises. According to the commandment, how is the Sabbath to be kept? Now, I'm going to put you guys on the, on the I'm going to stick it to you a little bit here because many of you are Seventh-day Adventists. I, myself, am a Seventh-day Adventist. And uh, ensconced right in the name, Seventh Day, Seventh Day. We have the name. We have the Sabbath. It's wrapped up that. Not everybody here. But for those of us that do, I'm going to put the thumb screws to you a little bit. And I'm going to say, according to that commandment that we just read, how is the Sabbath to be kept? Let me just read it to you again so, to refresh your brain, to refresh your memory. Remember the Sabbath day to keep it holy. Six days you shall labor and do all your work, but the seventh day is the Sabbath of the Lord your God. In it you shall do no work. You nor your son nor your daughter nor your male servant nor your female servant nor your cattle nor your stranger who is within your gates. For in six days the Lord made the heaven, the earth, the sea, and all that is in them, and he rested the seventh day. Therefore the Lord blessed the Sabbath day and hallowed it. Okay, I got a question. How do you keep the Sabbath according to the commandment? Oh, I love this part. Nobody seems to be quite sure. 
I'm asking you a question. According to the commandment, not that you're supposed to keep it, how? By spending time with God. The commandment does not say that. But that's a right answer, but the commandment doesn't say that. I'm saying, what does the text say? Oh, I'm hearing people say it. To rest. That's part one. Well done. What's the other part? Well, don't work is resting. That's just, it's two sides of the same coin. What is it? Worship? Worship's not in the commandment. It's not there. Holy? But I'm asking you how you keep it holy. Number one, you've got the first answer right. You rest. Okay, but, but we remember by resting. Yeah, we remember by resting. How do we set it apart? That's not what the commandment says. I want to know what the commandment says. See, I love the fact that you're struggling. You're struggling because you've never asked the most, many of you have never asked the most basic question. What does the commandment say you do to keep it? Now, I know that many of you do a lot of stuff, and you don't do a lot of stuff. I know that. It's not what I'm asking. I'm asking, what does the commandment say? Well, no work. You got that one right. That's resting. Okay. Let me give it to you here. By resting and giving others rest. That's what the commandment actually says. Right? There's nothing in there about going to church, by the way. You probably noticed that. The commandment doesn't say go to church. The commandment doesn't even say anything about worship. The word worship doesn't occur there. The word church doesn't occur there. The word gathering doesn't occur there. Right? When you read the commandment, if all you had was that commandment, and you said, okay, well, how do we keep it? It's clear. You rest, you give others rest. He says, he, he goes, and we're going to get to this in just a little bit. He says, your children don't work, and those that live in your household that are your servants, they don't work. Your employees aren't working. Even your cows aren't working. The way that you keep Sabbath, according to the commandment, is you rest. And as an extension of the rest that has been bestowed upon you by the hand of God, you extend that rest to others. That's it. Now, here's a very interesting thing. I'm going to read you something quite interesting. I'm going to go to a book that most of us basically never read. It's a book called Leviticus. It's the next book. And I'm going to go to Leviticus chapter 23, and I'm just going to read. You're welcome to join me, but you don't have to. You just get a feel for the shape of what I'm going to read here. In Leviticus chapter 23, God here is giving the Jews a bunch of feasts, a bunch of feasts, right? And um, there were three feasts in the spring, and there were three feasts in the fall. These were uniquely Jewish feasts, okay? Now, they were to be kept in very specific and very fastidious ways, okay? Let me just read you. We'll start, well, I'll just read you some of the feast of the first fruits, okay? Just let this settle in, okay? Here we go. And the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, I'm in Leviticus 23, verse 9, Speak to the children of Israel and say to them, When you come into the land which I give you to reap its harvest, then you will bring a sheaf of the first fruits of your harvest to the priest. He will wave the sheaf before the Lord to be accepted on your behalf on the day after the Sabbath. The priest shall wave it. And you shall offer on that day, when you wave the sheaf, a male lamb of the first year without blemish, a burnt offering to the Lord. Its grain offering shall be two-tenths of an ephah of fine flour mixed with oil, an offering made by fire to the Lord for a sweet aroma, and its drink offering will be of wine, one-fourth of a hin. And you shall eat neither bread nor parched grain nor fresh grain until that same day that you have brought an offering to your God. It shall be a statute forever throughout all of your generations and all of your dwellings. Well, let's just keep going. This is fun. And you shall count for yourselves, I'm in verse 15, from the day after the Sabbath, from the day that you brought the sheaf of the wave offering, seven Sabbaths will be completed. Count 50 days to the day after the seventh Sabbath. Then you shall offer a new grain offering to the Lord. You shall bring from your dwellings two wave loaves of two-tenths of an ephah. They shall be a fine flour, and they shall be baked with leaven. They are the first fruits of the Lord. You can read it. Is that fairly specific instructions about how to keep, say, Passover and the Feast of First Fruits and the Feast of Pentecost and later the Feast of Trumpets and the uh, Day of Atonement? Is that fairly? Yeah, great details there. A lot of details there. And notice that those details revolve around things, listen to me carefully here, that are very Jewish. Offerings, in fact, look at this. What's not there in the Sabbath commandment? 
Well, there is no special ceremony communicated in the Sabbath commandment. It's not there. You just read it. We just read the Seventh-day Sabbath commandment. We read it. We read it twice, actually. And there is no mention of a ceremony. There's no mention of any ritual there, number one. Number two, there's no offerings. Here, you have to bring this as the burnt offering, and then this is the wine offering. This is the grain offering. This is the new grain offering. You only eat parched grain. You don't... None of that in the Sabbath commandment. Not only no ceremonies, no rituals, there's no offerings, and there's no ritual washings. You don't have to wear anything special or wash in any ceremonially significant way. In other words, the Seventh-day Sabbath has nothing distinctly Jewish. Now let this settle in for just a moment, because for me, as somebody who became a Sabbath keeper, somebody who said, I'm gonna, man, I want to be free to keep Sabbath. As somebody who elected to make that decision, as I was in the beginnings of that process of making the decision, I was 24 years old, 25, early in my, my career of Sabbath keeping, people would say to me, well, what are you keeping the Jewish Sabbath for? Anybody else here that keeps Sabbath ever heard that? It's Jewish. Oh, really? I beg to differ. Au contraire, mon frere. When I read the Sabbath command, I find that it is decidedly non-Jewish. I can't find anything Jewish in the Sabbath. There's no rituals there. There's no ceremonies there. There's no washings there. There's no special offerings there. There's no restrictions about what you eat and don't eat there. What the Sabbath says is, rest, give others rest. Now, here's a remarkable thing. Take a look at this. The Sabbath wasn't Jewish. It was also given to the Jews because God loves Jews just like he loves Gentiles. But there was a Sabbath before there was ever a Jew. That's why we spent a little time getting to the story of Abraham there in Genesis. Here the Sabbath is introduced and then we've got to go through hundreds of years, two millennia, before we finally get to the story of Abraham. But even when we get to the story of Abraham, we still have to go through about three to four hundred years to get to the story of Moses where the Sabbath is given in an official and codified sense from Mount Sinai. But before there was an Abraham and before there was a Moses, God, before there was a sin, before there was death, before there was disease, in the garden, God created a social, spiritual space in time. And it had nothing to do with being Jewish. And when you get to the commandment, Moses knows this. I mean, Moses wrote Leviticus too. If God had wanted to brand the Sabbath, tsh, I grew up in Wyoming, we'd brand cattle, right? Tsh, if God wanted to brand tsh, the Seventh-day Sabbath with something that was, that was distinctly and decidedly Jewish, well, we have instances of this right in Scripture. Bring this offering, wash in this way, don't eat this, make sure you eat this, this is the ritual, this is the ceremony. It's not there. You read, this, read the Sabbath command, what it says is, rest, give others rest. So, imagine the surprise of my friends that were advising me about the Jewishness of the Sabbath when I read them these words from Jesus, which makes such amazing sense in their context, where Jesus says, the Sabbath, I'm in Mark chapter 2, verses 27 and 28, where Jesus says, check this out, the Sabbath was made for man and not man for the Sabbath. Therefore, the Son of Man is Lord of the Sabbath. The word that Jesus uses here is the word anthropos. Anthropos, from which we get the word anthropology. What is anthropology the study of? It's the study of civilization, the study of mankind. The Sabbath was made for man. Just as it was given to Adam and Eve in the garden before there was sin, before there was death, God gave them a social, spiritual place. Why? Because they're social beings and because they're spiritual beings, and he gave them a space. And, and Jesus comes all the way to the New Testament. He says, oh yeah, the Sabbath? Oh yeah, that was made for man. Now this is remarkable because when you read the Gospel of John, let me just read you a few little gems from the Gospel of John. Just, just brief little gems here that ought to stir your soul. I'm in John chapter 5. Verse 1, after this, there was a feast of the Jews, and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Interesting. I'm in chapter 6, verse 4 of John. Now the Passover, a feast of the Jews, was near. 
I'm in John chapter 7, verse 2. Now the Jews' feast of tabernacles was at hand. And there are other instances. When John speaks of the Passover or of the Feast of Tabernacles, he's very clear on who that was given to. It was the Jews' Feast of Tabernacles. It was the Jews' Passover. It was given especially and specifically to the Jews. And it was a huge blessing, those feasts. They were designed to announce the ministry of Messiah and the career of Messiah. But it's interesting. The Sabbath was for man. But the Passover and the Tabernacles, and that's Jewish. Take a look at this. Why is, there, why is there this decided non-Jewishness in the Sabbath commandment? Look at this. The Sabbath's non-Jewishness looks backward and forward. It looks backward to creation when God gave the Sabbath to Adam before there was ever a Jew, and to Eve as well. And it looks forward to the church when not only Jews, but Gentiles will come in. And no wonder when we come to the New Testament book of Acts, both Jews and and Gentiles are keeping Sabbath. It stands to reason, because the Sabbath was not Jewish. In fact, it's decidedly non-Jewish. Let me just say something about that very briefly, and then I'm going to wrap this up. I'm going to land this plane. One of the complaints about the book of Exodus, one of the complaints about all the writings of Moses from liberal scholars is that Moses actually didn't write those books. Right? There is a brand of liberal scholarship that says that these books that are allegedly written by Moses were actually written many centuries later. They were written in the post-exilic period, which means the time after or just before the, the exile in Babylon. Right? And people were redacting, they were, they were putting words back into Moses' mouth that he allegedly said. Right? Now here's a major argument against this basic thesis. If somebody was writing hundreds of years in the future and putting words, especially at a time of strong Jewish identity and strong Jewish patriotism after the exile, they really wanted to emphasize and in some cases overemphasize their Jewishness and their heritage. If they were revisioning and redacting and putting words back hundreds of years into Moses' mouth, you can be sure that in the Sabbath commandment there would have been something very Jewish in there. And yet there's nothing. Rest? Give rest. Amen. That's it. Rest? Give rest. And by the way, there is very little doubt in my mind in the minds of many well-meaning, well, well-informed scholars that believe that Jesus was referencing exactly this in Matthew chapter 11 when he said, Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will Sabbath you. I will give you rest. I will bring you back to the Garden of Eden, a little oasis in time, a temple in time. Let's wrap this up. Let's land this plane. Dr. Samuel Bakayoki, the late Dr. Samuel Bakayoki, writes in Divine Rest for Human Restlessness, the Sabbath rest teaches the greedy heart to be grateful, to stop for one day looking for more, and to start instead gratefully to acknowledge the blessings already received. The Sabbath is an affrontery to materialism, to consumerism, to this radical idea that if we just had more, a little more, or the newest and latest and greatest, there would be happiness at the end of that rainbow. Well, materialism is bankrupt. Consumerism is bankrupt. Some of the wealthiest people I know have figured out that money doesn't bring happiness. They're driving pickup trucks that you wouldn't drive. One of my friends, a good friend, close friend, is worth millions of dollars. And if you met him, you'd never know it because he's, he's figured out. That all of that doesn't bring happiness. At the end of the day, you know, as a pastor, I get to sit down with people toward the end of their lives often, and it's very rare that I'll sit at somebody's bedside and they'll say, you know, Dave, as I'm looking the specter of death in the face, if I have one regret, it's that I didn't buy a newer car. (laughs) That 2014 was so much better than the 2013. I needed that OnStar navigation. Right? No, 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 no. When people come to the end of their lives, they're saying, I wish I would have spent more time with my kids. I wish I would have spent more time with my family. Or, sadly, tragically, when people have major regrets about the way they've conducted their relationships, they will be haunted by regrets, haunted by the fact that they had unresolved issues with their dad or their mom or their brother or their sister. It always comes down to relationships. And the Sabbath tells us every week it's about relationships with one another and with God. It's about resting 
and giving rest. Here's one of my favorites. This is from Dr. Sigve Tonstad. He wrote the best book I've ever read on the Sabbath. It's called The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day, and if it's not in your library, it should be. The Lost Meaning of the Seventh Day. Write that down. You need that book. You need to own that book. He says, The seventh day must be seen as the launching pad for the most exceptional and ambitious project of social justice in the ancient world. Their freedom from work and from the yoke of exploitation are explicit characteristics of the Sabbath. When the circle is drawn, nothing and nobody lie outside its domain. The particulars on this list are amazing because no parallels have been found in other cultures. There's nothing like it in other cultures. Legislation of this kind in the ancient world prioritizes from the bottom up and not from the top looking down, giving first consideration to the weakest and most vulnerable members of society. I absolutely love this point that he's making here. Those who need rest the most, and God in the commandment singles out the slave, the resident alien, and the beast of burden. All are singled out for special mention. In the rest of the seventh day, the underprivileged, even mute animals, find an ally. This is the God that we serve, the God who notices when a sparrow falls to the ground, the God who says, hey, be sure, be sure your cows are getting a day of rest. Yeah, you know you need one, but be sure you're not working your stranger. Be sure you're not working the resident alien, the non-Jew. Be sure that your cows are, even your cows are resting. Anything that thwarts or detracts from God's creational intent comes from the enemy, right? It's no wonder that in these three, creation, conflict, and covenant, that the sign of creation itself has been hugely conflicted and hugely controversial. Well, why? Because it points us back to creation. And if time allowed, I could show you that it points us to covenant. In fact, time does allow. Look at this. (laughs) Exodus chapter 31, verse 16. Therefore, the children of Israel shall keep the Sabbath to observe the Sabbath throughout their generations as a perpetual covenant as a sign. You say, well, that's the children of Israel. Yeah, check this one out. Isaiah 56, verses 6 and 7. Also, the sons of the foreigner, that's non-Jews, Gentiles, Also, the sons of the foreigner who join themselves to the Lord, who become followers of the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, to serve him and to love the name of the Lord, to be his servants. Everyone who keeps from defiling the Sabbath and holds fast my what? What's the word? My covenant. Even them I will bring to my holy mountain and make them joyful in my house of prayer. For my house will be called a house of prayer for everybody, for mankind, for all people. Just exactly what Jesus had said, for anthropos. You see, the Sabbath, the Sabbath brings together both creation and covenant. Little wonder that it is a source of such conflict. Ah, oh, the centrality of the Sabbath. The Sabbath was made for mankind as a temple in time. Now, the usher is going to hand out a card, and I want you to take that card. Matt and Joseph are going to come up and sing us one of the most beautiful songs you've ever heard about this subject. Now, you've got a card there. Can you place one of those in my hand? I lost mine. Oh, no, I think I do have it. I do have it. Look at this. I lost it and I found it. That which was lost is found. You've got a card in your hand there. And uh, I want to walk you through this card about this temple in time, this thing, this link to creation, this link to covenant. And believe me when I tell you, we have literally only scratched the surface of the surface of the surface of the surface on this tonight. We're just barely scratching the surface. The main point that I want to bring out, and I hope you've really gotten it, is that the Sabbath is a social, spiritual place created for social, spiritual beings, number one. Number two, there's nothing Jewish. There's nothing distinctly or discernibly Jewish about the Sabbath. Why? Because the Sabbath goes all the way back to creation, and it goes all the way forward to recreation. It's a gift from the hand of Jesus. It's a gift of freedom. Freedom from modernity, freedom from slavery, freedom from consumerism, freedom from materialism, freedom from being a workaholic. Any workaholics here? I'm a playaholic. (laughs) Not recovering. Freedom. And you've got a card in your hand there, and it goes like this. Number one says, I believe that Jesus is creator and redeemer. Okay. If you believe that, just check it. I believe that Jesus is creator. I believe that Jesus is the redeemer. We spent time on redeemer yesterday, creator today. That Jesus is, by the way, the Bible says in the beginning was the word. Jesus was the word. The word was made flesh. That is a direct reference to Genesis chapter one, that three word phrase, and God said, and God said, and God said. The means by which God created was Christ. Woo! 
Number two, I choose to rest in his work. Yeah, that makes sense. He's God after all. And if he is created, I'll rest in his creation. And if he is redeemed, I'll rest in his redemption. And if he is saved, I'll rest in his salvation. I receive that rest that Jesus promised. Come unto me, all you that labor and are heavy laden, and I will Sabbath you. I will give you rest. You say, yeah, I'll take that. I choose to rest in his work. Number three, I received the gift of the Sabbath from Jesus' hands. And that's what it is. It's a gift. It's a gift that Jesus gives to you that puts you in touch with pre-sin, pre-death, pre-disease creation. Back in the beginning, when God looked out at the vast expanse of what he had created and he said, man, that's really good. And what was part of that really good creation was this social, spiritual connection that God had with his creation. Adam and Eve, come hang out. Let's spend some time together. Come on, let's spend some time together. I've created a space and time just for us. Number four says, I want to be baptized. And we had a number of people check that last night. And so I said, man, if people are going to make that decision, I'm going to put it on there again. I want to be baptized. And those of you that, man, we haven't even really talked about it here, but those of you that are thinking, man, I'd like to head that direction, you check it. I can tell you the date I was baptized, June 6, 1996. I don't know many dates, but I know April 4th, 1999 and June 6, 1996. Baptism, marriage. The rest, it's a blur, but I got those two dates. I would like to receive Bible studies and more information on these things. Check. I have a special need and would like to help. Would like help, rather. Please write the details on the back. We are here to help. I just had lunch today with the pastoral team that's helping to put this on. I tell you, this is a great group of guys. Beautiful people. Love Jesus. Love ministry. And uh, for those of you that are members of their churches, you're, you're blessed to have these guys. And uh, I know that if there's anything that, that they can do to be a blessing, they will do it. Matt and Joseph are going to sing a song for us, and the song is called Temple of Time. And we put the lyrics for you up there on the screen so that you can, you can not only bask in the beauty of their voice and the guitar, but that you can appreciate, you can intellectually appreciate and, and soak in these words and worship your Creator. It's been awesome to be with you tonight. God took six days and created earth and moon and stars and sun. On the seventh day he rested from the work that he had done. Then he blessed it, made it holy as a gift for every man to
Thank you. Boy, this temple of time that God comes with us. The cards that you have, if you would send those passes out to the outside aisles or the center aisle so our ushers can pick those up. And I want to again thank you for being here. And quick reminder tomorrow before we pray that meeting here at 930, be a lot more music to enjoy, a lot of really special things planned today at 11 o'clock. We appreciated David sharing from heart and helping us understand a God whose heart beats with love for his people and the desire to spend time with them, not only now, in this time called Sabbath, but also throughout eternity. Thank you for being here, and let's, let's pray together at this time. Lord Jesus, I thank you that you came to make known what is eternal, that you came to live and demonstrate what is essential. And Lord, I am so grateful for the privilege that we have of entering into this temple of time with you. It's a foretaste of eternity, Lord, where you will be gathering all of your people through all the ages so that we can always and forever be with the one who loves us so much. Thank you, Lord, for each person here and the opportunity we have to, to come and discover together what a wonderful God we have the privilege of serving. Bless us, dear Jesus, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Thank you for being here. We'll see you tomorrow.